Good morning, everybody. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, in fact, depending on where you are um, dialing in from today. Um, thank you for joining us for the first of um, three webinars that um, Hope and Homes for Children is hosting over the next couple of weeks. Um, my name is Kate Cavell. I'm Head of Pro Bono and Community Investment at Allen Overy and delighted to be hosting the first one today. Um, so just a quick bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, we will be recording the presentation. Um, we are keeping participants' microphones and videos off um, to help with the connection. And please bear in mind that Mark and Tessa are calling in from Uganda and Hong Kong. So if there are technology issues, then please forgive them. Um, having said that, I've just had a notification on my computer to say that my VPN is terminating. So this could cause a problem. Hopefully it will be okay. Um, if you choose the speaker view on the top right hand corner of the screen, this will allow you to see the speakers more clearly. Um, and we will have loads of opportunities for questions at the end. If you can send those messages to me in the chat function, um, and then I can read those out towards the end of the session. So do please continue to send those through um, over the next hour. So um, the reason that we are hosting um, these seminars or helping to host these seminars is Hope and Homes for Children is our global charity partner. We've been working with them for um, a year now and have another 18 months to go. Um, and we've learned so much during our time working with Hope and Homes. We're really pleased to give the opportunity for more people to learn about their work too. So um, to get on with the interesting bit of the day, um, I'm really delighted to welcome Isabel Eaton who is story writer and gatherer at Hope and Homes for Children, who will be doing the interviewing for this series. Um, and also to welcome our first speakers, um, Tessa Boudry and Mark Riley. Tessa heads up Hope and Homes for Children's regional work in Asia. Um, and Mark is the project lead for um, Hope and Homes work in India. And I was absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to travel over to India with him, what seems like a million years ago. Um, so anyway, between them, they've got a wealth of knowledge to share with you. So really happy to hand over to Isabel. Good morning, evening, afternoon. Um, I know that people joining us today have different levels of understanding uh, about volunteerism. And some people will have a lot of expertise and some people will be um, finding out about this for the first time. So my first question um, to Tessa is to ask, um, what is meant by volunteerism? Is it a made up word? Is it a real thing? What is it? I would think it's a real thing, yes. Um, volunteerism is a form of tourism in which travellers participate in voluntary work when they're travelling. Um, and that is usually uh, for a charity or an NGO or uh, community-based organisations, often in developing countries. Um, and it's usually longer than a normal foreign uh, holiday or a trip. So um, this, uh, today we talk about orphanage tourism. So this is then volunteer tourism specifically in orphanages um, where working with orphans is a, a central part of the itineraries of these travelers. Mark, do we have any um, idea of the scale of this? Is it popular? Was it a growing phenomenon before COVID stopped people traveling for, for the time being? Uh, certainly, it's, it's grown over the last few years uh, until the pandemic hit, which we can touch on a bit later. Uh, but certainly, visiting orphanages, um, volunteerism is certainly a part of the landscape here in Uganda and also the work and research that I've done with Tessa and other organizations really uh, show us that it is a significant challenge um, and it's very popular. Um, so yes, uh, my small research that I did in Uganda some years back, which sort of prompted me to do my master's degree in it, uh, showed us that there were uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds being spent in Uganda by people coming and spending some time in an orphanage. Um, Tessa, do we know much about where people come from and what motivates them um, to, to do volunteerism? Um, where people come from, I would say all over the world. Uh, different countries have different um, uh, visitors, I would say. So from our study in Uganda, we saw that uh, the majority of people uh, volunteering in orphanages were on mission trips. Um, 
mainly from the US in that, um, in that case. Um, but in principle, um, everyone in the world, usually from a more developed country, can go to, um, to participate in volunteerism. So it's not specifically a particular country per se. In terms of uh, motivations, I would say um, that people would like to have a, a stronger connection to the country that they're traveling to and feel the, the sort of need to do something active and, and give back. Um, it can be curiosity as well. Um, some people will come to volunteer uh, for religious reasons, uh, feeling the need to, um, uh, yeah, to, to, to work and give because that's part of their um, religion. Um, other people will, will volunteer um, in this way uh, to escape their life, their, their reality. Um, people can be disappointed uh, with, uh, with the lifestyle they live or, or the, maybe the, the wealth they have and, and prefer to, to be part of a different type of, um, of setting and work. Um, and in some cases, um, it's also resume building. Uh, we see that a lot with gap year students who feel the need uh, to volunteer in, a, in, a, in one of those countries to be able to say on their resume that they've done work like that. And sadly, as we know, there are no shortage of orphanages around the world for people to, to volunteer in. Mark, why are so many children living in orphanages in countries like Nepal and Uganda? Yeah, it's a, 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 a good question, Isabel. And there's been a lot of studies on it. Hope and Homes have been involved in a lot of studies. And of course, uh, our work around the world uh, shows us that, uh, you know, poor families often see orphanages as a way of receiving free services for their children. Families which are struggling, uh, families which are going through some maybe short-term challenges, maybe there's been some uh, environmental challenges and displacement um, and people are just poor. Uh, <clears throat> so people see orphanages as a way of placing their children into somewhere where they may feel is safe and that they can receive education, housing, food um, and it families feel as if that alleviates some of the pressure on themselves. Of course what they don't realize is that you know, the detachment from their children causes huge problems and the institutionalization of children really causes huge problems. Um, so every country that has a large uh, number of orphanages will have those kind of push and pull factors. We also know that uh, children in orphanages are not Orphans. It's a, it's a word that I don't like using anyway, because we don't like stigmatizing children with a particular label. Um, and one of my colleagues once said to me, if you label a child an orphan, you respond to the label, not the individual needs of the child. Um, but in a technical sense, we know that 85% of children in orphanages are not orphans in the sense of they have a, one or two parents alive. Um, in many countries, like countries like Uganda, countries in Africa, countries in Asia, we also know that the idea of family is far bigger and wider than perhaps we know in, in the West. So in Uganda, uh, everyone, children will call aunties their mums, uh, will call uncles their fathers. It's more communal family. Um, so, in fact, you could say even though 85% of children actually have a living parent it, who are in orphanages, uh, actually the extended family is far bigger than that. All children will have some kind of connection and family. So even the premise and the word orphanage is very misleading and it can really motivate people to do uh, you know, the wrong thing by supporting orphanages. It actually, orphanage actually causes separation of families rather than helping out with some of the needs that families may have. Yeah it is a catch-all term obviously but there are characteristics for all the different institutions that that we're targeting in in the, the sense that children are separated from your, their families as you say 
and then uh, are kept in, in, in relatively large numbers for a long time in a sort of um, residential setting without a family environment. Tessa, can you talk to us about what's wrong then, given the scale of this need, with volunteering in these institutions? Yeah, so Mark has already made clear what's, um, what is actually wrong with children being in, in orphanages, given the fact that they actually are not orphans. Um, it, it's truly sad that uh, children are being placed in orphanages while they have um, living family. And um, we, we believe that children should have the chance to grow up in loving families. So the fact that orphanages exist um, makes it um, an option for people who are um, facing, facing issues. Um, and that can, can be, um, as Mark described, that can be uh, domestic violence, that can be poverty, access, uh, difficult of, difficulties, access to education, health, etc. Um, but if these orphanages would not exist, and if other, other services would be in place, then there would be chances where children actually can stay at home. And if there is actually a chance that they can't stay at home, and there are other options such as kinship care, foster care, and you know, these type of services, then orphanages um, were not necessary. And that's why we see actually in um, many more developed countries that orphanages no longer exist because these services to prevent family separation um, are in place. And so um, families can actually stay together. So in, in if we, if we then go with the idea that orphanages are not necessarily the best place for children to grow up in, we have to think what it actually means that people volunteer in these orphanages. Yes, we see that um, with volunteering comes often money. And um, we unfortunately see quite often that it actually becomes an income generating activity to have an orphanage and to, to host volunteers. Um, and so in, in that sense, we, uh, we, we would say that you actually contribute to these damaging effects um, of, of children in, in orphanages. And um, it's also, um, I would say the, unfortunately, there are people who, use these opportunities to actually start an orphanage because they see the value um, and the financial value I would say of having children in institutions. So what happens is that we then see um, active um, matchmakers I would say going into very poor areas and say you know what I can help you why don't you give me your child and I will make sure your child gets an education and a roof over its head um, uh, food, etc., and desperate, very poor families buy into that. They think, "Oh, I'm giving my child a better, a better future," and oftentimes these families actually pay for that service as well. So they pay the the matchmaker or the, the in between the middleman, um, and the middleman then gets money from the orphanage, and the orphanage gets funding from volunteers, uh, volunteerists from from donors. And um, therefore, it, it becomes this sort of business model, in a sense. Um, so as a volunteer, you sort of contribute to, um, to that mechanism. Um, another, another part, I mean, I can go on about this for a long time, but um, coming from another country, going into an orphanage as a volunteer, Oftentimes, uh, people don't have the skill to work, uh, skills to work with children. Um, are they trained social workers? Are they educators? Do they actually speak the local language? Are they, um, are, are they capable of doing that work? Um, if you turn it around and if you would look in, and I come from the Netherlands, for example, um, would a, um, a random volunteer be allowed to work in a daycare center, for example, in Holland? No, of course not. If you don't speak Dutch, if you're not a trained social worker, um, if, you, if you don't know anything about child protection, of course, there's also the, the whole police checks and, and the safety checks that are in place. 
um, that would not be possible that easily. So why do we have these sort of different values or these different standards uh, when we are at home and when we are elsewhere? So that's, uh, that's an issue, um, unfortunately, as well. I, I think the worst part that we have seen, and unfortunately Mark and I have seen a lot of this, is that orphanages also harbor pedophiles. Because obviously it's, a, it's an easy place to have direct access to children. And um, you can imagine what, um, what the damage is by that type of volunteering as well. So, so I imagine that a lot of people who are intending to volunteer in orphanages don't actually, haven't really thought about this. Um, and I understand that. Um, asking me 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have thought about this either. So it's a journey that, uh, that we, we have to go on. Um, but once, um, once you realize or understand this, it's actually a no-brainer. Why, um, why would we do this if it's not possible in our own countries? We're, we're not skilled, not, um, and not culturally um, adapting either. I mean, to, to work in a complete different cultural setting is, a, is, of course, also something that is strange working directly with very vulnerable children. So that's um, all of that. And also, of course, for the children. Can you imagine for these children having these uh, new caretakers or these new faces coming to them every two weeks, three weeks, whatever the, the time period is? Um, and every time, sorry, having to say goodbye again. Um, children who are already very vulnerable um, will, of course, create attachment issues through this. So yeah, there's, uh, there's many parts. I'm sure in some of the other questions this will come back, but this is my initial answer. Um, because in the course of my work, I have um, visited a lot of institutions. Um, and one thing everybody uh, notices is the way children respond to visitors, which is often very, very open, incredibly um, uh, you know, keen to make contact with you, to hold your hand and speak to you and so on. And this can be misinterpreted because this is actually really a sign of how incredibly vulnerable these children are, isn't it? Mark, could you say yeah, something yeah. about what the experience is actually like for a child growing up in an orphanage without individual parents and, and people to, to sort of love and protect them? Yeah, uh, and we've done a lot of research on this. Children which have disrupted attachments and by that I mean somebody who isn't their primary caregiver, showing them the love and affection and meeting their needs as they grow up as a child. When you disrupt that, um, i.e. when children are in orphanages, it can have long-term devastating effects on children, on their future relationships, on the way that they see the world. Um, and uh, in orphanages that is magnified and that is, is very damaging for children. Um, we are involved, Hope and Homes, and uh, all of us are involved in different networks of care leavers, trying to support care leavers, so those young adults who grew up in institutions, um, and, when, and they're a vulnerable population because they haven't had that level of support and care from a, a parent or primary caregiver that all children deserve, and that's their right. So when you disrupt that, you are really, you know, disrupting a child's growth and development. And we know that children in an institutional setting um, develop at a different rate than children who grow up in a family uh, setting. Uh, the, the other thing that I, that I would say is one thing that children who grow up in orphanages tell us now that they're adults is that mission trips coming and going they enjoyed some mission trips and would enjoy volunteers visiting because it was a break from their mundane routine. So in a sense, they enjoyed that aspect because it was something different. They would often get given different food when volunteers are there. So they would get given meat uh, and nice food where ordinarily they weren't getting that food. Um, but also they, they felt exploited. Now that they're adults and they can reflect on their childhood, especially when they have their own children and thinking about their own families, they reflect on their own childhood and they tell us, and um, we have a care leaver network in Uganda of 300 plus, and many, many of them tell us that being made to perform for visitors, uh, they now realize that that was quite exploitative. Even though they enjoyed singing and dancing, being forced 
as a part of being in an orphanage was really damaging for them. They felt exploited. Also, being forced to write to their donors um, was also something which they, they didn't enjoy um, because they were forced often by the directors of the orphanage to you know, make things up and to paint a different picture uh, in order to obtain more, more funds. We've even seen examples where a child's education was linked to how much money they could raise from their sponsors and from their own donors. So putting the, the responsibility on a child to maintain relationships with donors. Uh, and we've seen that quite a lot. When you add all of that up, it really, uh, it really doesn't provide the foundational things that a child needs to, to, to go on and have a fulfilling life in their own relationships and in their work. Uh, so we know that children from institutions are more likely to uh, be in disruptive and abusive relationships. We know that suicide rates of children that grew up in institutions is higher than in uh, society. So these are really significant things which happen to children, even though even though volunteers and even though orphanage owners believe often that they are helping, actually they are storing up a lot of problems for children when they grow up and are older. Yeah, because I think that, you know, the headline is that I think anybody who has contact with children, looks after children, has their own children, knows that they need so, so much more than food and shelter. Although, mm -hmm. obviously, when you see um, people struggling in poverty, it's, it's natural to want to provide a a better um, uh, you know, environment for them. Um, Tessa, you've already touched on this a little bit, and we both have, in terms of the fact that the majority of children in these institutions are not orphans, they have um, either parents or close relatives. Um, you've touched on what the, what the answer is to this, and it lies in the families. Could, could you say a little more about what the solution is to orphanages, what needs to be in place to make sure that children aren't um, you know, relinquished to, to these places? Um, yes, of course, um, you can look at this um, through the lens of, of um, children's care, you know, in, in, in a more broader sense. And if you look at that, um, you can think about what are um, factors that uh, cause children to end up in institutions and how can we prevent um, these, you know, how, how look at the symptoms first. Um, and so we, we call this, uh, this whole sort of identifying of the gaps and then filling the gaps a care reform. So for example, um, if there is um, a community, a specific community where there is a high number of children ending up in institutions, yeah, and you can, you can look at why is that particular uh, community uh, so vulnerable. If you then are able with trained community workers to address these vulnerabilities, you may be able to prevent uh, family separation. Um, this of course um, needs a fully trained social workforce. Um, this includes uh, community workers, uh, volunteers uh, from within the community who are actively identifying the most vulnerable um, families. It also means um, identifying what kinds of um, funds, for example, are in place that um, families can actually tap into. What we've seen, for example, in, in the work we do in India is that oftentimes families do not know that there are schemes existing um, that they can tap into if they are facing difficulties. And then I'm talking about financial schemes, for example. Um, so, so once we are able to sort of identify what these issues are, we're able to, to prevent children ending up in institutions. This, I mean, this sounds very simple and it's not. It's a very long process to go from, uh, from an, an, a broken system or a non-existing system that happens too, to um, a fully functioning system. That's a, that's a long journey. Um, but it is possible. I mean, we've, we've seen examples uh, within Hope and Homes in Romania, for example, uh, Rwanda, where uh, we have been able to, to support governments to, to really go through that process and having proper care systems in place eventually. One of the things that I think is, is also really important, if you were to remove 
um, orphanages from that sort of care scala, um, you, the families will actually automatically find other solutions. If, there, if that option wasn't there, um, they would look around and find other ways. So, for example, especially in Asia, um, an automatic response is kinship care. It's a very common, normal thing to do. And as Mark said, families are usually much broader and bigger than we can imagine. Um, but because these orphanages exist, it is seen as the first and easiest solution. So, so that's another thing. So I think um, on one hand, um, building up this, this whole care system um, with all the steps that that um, takes, um, and at the same time, removing institutions so that in, and that option no longer exists. Um, slowly, of course, I'm not saying to anybody to close all orphanages today, uh, because of course the reintegration of children from these institutions is also a process. But um, yeah, I think I think this answers your question. Yes, absolutely. And one thing I find very interesting that. Although um, obviously the process of getting skilled social workers uh, available to communities and able to work with families is, takes an awful lot of time and effort. Once you have that back up, I'm always amazed by sometimes how small and practical the interventions are that will spare a family from losing their children to an orphanage because they have resources and, and resilience and so on, but they sometimes need just, just a really quite a small practical piece of help to get them you know, to be able to stay together, which has life-changing um, implications for the children. Mark, can you say anything about that in terms of your experience, like the, the kind of really imaginative interventions that have really helped family to keep going and stay together? Yeah, I think I think a lot of a lot of it revolves also around parenting and how we can help communities to be better at parenting children, um, and how we can um, negate. Uh, the removal of children into into institutions, all of the things that Tessa said. However, people listening will also be saying, yes, but I know of situations where children were being harmed in their family. And I know of situations where there was exploitation and abuse within the community. Um, so what do you do with in those situations? And I think that to answer that, placing children in an institution for the long term isn't the answer. The answer is, to strengthen communities and to make sure that there are temporary options for children to be cared for by someone else in the case of abuse uh, within a community. So we are not trying to say that all communities and all families are perfect. We know they can be disruptive and we know that some families go through difficult times and bad things happen. Um, so if we do everything to prevent separation and if we do everything to strengthen the family we know that there are situations when children may end up out of the family and in those situations that's where we have to promote as tessa said kinship care so children can live with relatives and strengthen that system it happens all the time in asia and africa we also can look at community carers so people within the community who are respected and trustworthy whether it's formal or informal sort of foster care and look at foster care informal and formal as places where children can temporarily be cared for because we know that there are some situations where that's needed um, and i think we want to strengthen all of those systems so as we reduce on the number of orphanages we are also increasing and building up a community's capacity to be safer, to be healthier, and to look after each other with all of the alternative care type systems as well. Thank you. Um, and now, um, Tessa, if we, if we can have a, a turn to the countries that you know are, are um, specifically uh, interesting to our A and O partner, mm -hmm. um, could you just sketch out the general situation around orphanage volunteerism in Nepal and Uganda now, um, given all that's happened in the the last few months? Uh, yes, now. So Nepal, <laughs> um, in a study that Mark and myself did uh, with a funding stream analysis uh, we did before the pandemic, uh, it became clear that for Nepal, 97% of the funding for institutions or orphanages actually comes from outside of Nepal. So th this was uh, partly uh, by foreign tourists who then returned home and continued to support the, the orphanage that they worked in um, and partly other foreign donors. Um, 
but obviously right now people cannot travel and this this has a severe impact on um, institutions um, in these countries um, we've we've seen different sometimes knee-jerk knee um, reactions from governments where um, they've said okay let's um, reintegrate all children immediately before we do a lockdown um, which of course is um, is a scary thought as well because that is a process children ended up in institutions for a reason and and you can't just simply buy a bus ticket and send them back home there is a whole lot of uh, work that needs to be done to prepare both the child and the family and make these do these assessments to see if actually that is the best place for the children so um, that has happened um, as well um, but tourists no longer uh, come so um, that is an um, yeah, that, that has a huge um, effect we have seen recently one orphanage in um, Nepal and I usually don't use the word orphanage I usually say institution um, but um, where the care givers had taken off because of lack of funding coming in. They left um, a group of children by themselves um, in, in the institution. And the government only realized that two months after, these kids were between seven and 11 years old. They were, they were not allowed to leave because it was locked down. So they were locked up at home for two months. Can you imagine? what kind of effect that has. That, that financial implication is huge. Um, and and uh, looking at Nepal the, in, in terms of economic situation, um, the two main sources of income in Nepal are tourism and remittance. Um, both are jeopardized at the moment, obviously. So um, yeah, we will see on one hand, the closure of more institutions, which is, um, it sounds like a good idea, but having this done in a very um, fast or, or quick way, it's, um, it's actually potentially putting children in, in a more difficult situation than they are. Um, and we will see um, orphanages that may potentially continue, uh, but with a lot less resources uh, putting children in a difficult situation as well. So it's very difficult. So, I mean, part of the work that we do is with governments. So we're in constant conversation with governments about how can we make sure that this is done? Um, how do we support these children who are currently in this um, system? And how do we make sure that we find other options for them that are safe um, and, and where uh, children can be placed either back with their families or in, in other uh, support services. But yes, it, I mean, at the moment, it, through, uh, because of this uh, current pandemic, um, that will have a huge effect. And I, I, I'll leave it to Mark to answer this question for Uganda, but um, I would expect it to be similar. Mark, yes, if you, if you could tell us about Uganda. And also I understand um, there's real concern that there are rushed and unplanned reintegrations going on quite a large scale in India as well? Uh, yes, I think globally we are starting to see, because of the pandemic, we are starting to see governments and even institutions themselves, because they don't have the resources to look after children, sending them back in, in a very unplanned way. And that isn't something that we advocate. Uh, everything has to be done and assessed and monitored and supported. And as Tessa said, get to the root causes of why children are displaced and not with their family in the first place. Um, in, in Uganda, we, we, before the pandemic, uh, you, you, any flight that you would come into Uganda on, you would see mission trips of people come in. Um, obviously, a lot of religious motivation, scriptures like James 1.27, true religion is when we care for widows and orphans. People, has, people have misinterpreted that to come and help orphanages and build orphans, uh, build orphanages and support children in orphanages. Um, of course, since the pandemic, that, that's slowed down and we haven't seen that because there's been a travel ban um, and many orphanages are having to uh, struggle and survive and they're not being able to feed their children properly and they're not being able to feed the 
uh, the, the many orphanages are also sending children back, back to their communities. Um, that alone should give us a lesson that actually when there's a pandemic, when there's a crisis, the default is for children to be in their communities and families. So that's what we should be aiming to do as we come out of the pandemic, is to strengthen families and communities to make sure that they can absorb the shocks that we've seen and absorb uh, you know, the challenges which come along the way, make them more resilient. Um, so we have an opportunity post-pandemic to reset um, some of the thinking around institutional care. Uh, we are concerned, Isabel, that as soon as we can fly in and out of countries again, that we will see teams of missionaries and mission trips and volunteers come into countries. And then that means that more children will be recruited in, into institutions. And there are some ongoing discussions globally, and some countries have made some progress, uh, where we are looking at if children are recruited into an institution and therefore being exploited, um, that is a form of trafficking. And we haven't mentioned the word trafficking yet, but certainly for us in child protection, we believe that if, if children are maliciously uh, targeted and, and parents coerced to place their children into institutional care, that that is a form of trafficking. And we are very worried that post-pandemic, we will see this surge so one of the reasons for having this call, and we're very grateful for a and for hosting this, is so that we can start to talk about these issues and get these issues um, spoken about so that collectively um, we can collaborate more and start to address this issue. Thank you. And, and maybe we should yeah, move now to, to the trafficking question and deal with that head on. Tessa, could you say something about the connection uh, between the demand for orphanage volunteerism and orphanage trafficking and child trafficking. Yeah, I, I think um, Mark has mentioned it a little bit already, but um, if you were to look at um, recruiting children actively um, and if you were to be able to call that uh, trafficking, which in, in you know, we're, we're now pushing for, um, then it can be prosecuted as such as well. Um, and so the link between um, orphanage tourism and fallen tourism and uh, this trafficking, we have um, we, we have seen that link, right? If these volunteers would not come, then oftentimes these children would not have ended up there. I mean, there's a direct correlation. Um, for example, in Cambodia, um, we see, we have seen uh, when the country opened more for tourists, uh, the number of um, orphanages increased hugely as well. It was the same, um, this, so in, in times where actually there were less orphans in Cambodia than there was, uh, you know, right after the genocide. Um, suddenly all these orphanages popped up because um, foreigners were being allowed into the country. So that sort of direct correlation is, um, is there. Um, and so if we are, if we are able to, to look at that recruiting of children as um, trafficking and our, um, our colleague, uh, Kate von Dor uh, from the partner organization, Forget Me Not, who we work with in Nepal, has done a lot of um, research and, and advocacy around this point. Um, and this in Australia has been able to um, discuss this under the Modern Slavery Act, for example. Um, if we are able to to push it more from that angle, um, I think we can make progress. Another thing um, that we have not really talked about is actually the role of the sending countries. So we can, of course, say um, the Indian government should do this or the Nepali government should do this. But actually, we have a responsibility ourselves as well, don't we? Um, so I know, um, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, we're busy with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to get that sort of regulated. Um, but these are not easy uh, tasks. Um, Sweden is, is very busy with this topic as well. So there is some work around that. But it, we can't just say it's a, a problem of the receiving country. It's actually a, a problem on our side as well. One of the things I have not mentioned is that um, in Nepal, 
it's actually illegal to volunteer. And many people don't know that. So in, as a foreigner in Nepal, um, to be able to do any kind of work, it being voluntary, uh, voluntary or um, a paid job, you need to have a business um, visa. It's very difficult to obtain a business visa. Um, and it, it can take years. And so we can assume that the, the volunteers who are actually working in Nepal don't have a visa like that. So in a sense, they are uh, working illegally. And that is something that we hopefully are able to highlight further as well. Um, especially, I mean, can you imagine for um, parents of children on gap years going to Nepal, if these parents would know that their children were actually um, while thinking they're doing the right thing, we're actually um, involved in um, illegal work. Um, I think it will be very easy to, uh, you know, to, to make that stop. So I think I'm, I'm deviating a bit. I am not sure if I actually completely answered and your that, question. That's fine, but, but I'm just going <laughs> to go back to Mark and I obviously take on board your point about, um, uh, you know, all countries have a, have a responsibility to, to tackle this problem for children everywhere. But Mark, what, what's being done to prevent and tackle orphanage trafficking in Nepal, Uganda and India now? Um, can you talk a bit more about, you know, what, what's actually happening? Um, I, well, there's governments are starting to get uh, better prepared for this. Uh, Uganda has done some work around trafficking uh, and there's quite a lot going on to prevent trafficking uh, as, a, as a more broader issue rather than trafficking in terms of institutional care. So there's a lot going on there. Um, but not enough is being done in the countries and not enough is being done in the sending countries, that's, that's for sure. Um, getting people to recognize this as an issue in terms of trafficking is, is probably the first thing that we need to do. Because if a child is placed into an institution, um, people still see uh, that it's a good thing to do because you're helping a child. Um, so we need to win that uh, argument in our own countries uh, before we can really encourage and work with countries uh, like Uganda and Nepal, India, in order to curb it uh, as a wider and as a global issue. Um, but there are things happening. Uh, countries are having task force uh, set up to, to look at this. I know Hope and Homes are very involved in task forces and, work, and working groups to, to look at this um, issue of uh, trafficking in orphanages um, and, and uh, I always when somebody thinks that they're sponsoring a child to stay you know to be cared for in an orphanage I always use the example that it takes about 30 seconds to one minute to click through and sponsor a child in an orphanage and you spend your $30 and you um, a month and you think you're helping a child well you actually could be condemning that child for up to 18 years in an institution and you could be funding someone to traffic that child into the orphanage for you to fund so i think there's some fundamental messages that we need to start getting out there that you know volunteering in an orphanage could actually lead to trafficking of children and harm children um, hugely in the process so not enough is being done, Isabel, but I think we can chat a little about, about, uh, about what, what is being done in terms of the tourist industry, um, because they have recognized it as a problem. Mm -hmm. And many tour operators have withdrawn visiting orphanages as a part of their packages. So I think that there are some very encouraging signs for sure. Just before we get on to that and what you know, the COVID um, uh, situation means for tourism and then possibly for volunteerism. Tessa, um, right at the beginning when you were talking about the motivation for people to engage in this kind of um, volunteering abroad, a lot of those motivations are really um, well meant and particularly very young people. It's a good impulse and we don't want to be too negative about this. What would you say are the um, options? Are there any ethical forms of volunteerism? Um, you know, what could people do when they genuinely want to address these, these issues of children's rights, um, but we're saying to them, absolutely do not volunteer in orphanages? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think especially the, the, the intentions is, um, is a very important point. I would not want to discourage anyone to not be interested in child rights um, globally. 
it's it's good we we need that we need people who are having that that uh, empathy um so i in case of traveling i always say um go and learn instead of go and think you can give because if there is an equal exchange of learning from each other there can be some some truth to that and there can be some um strength to that um i can give a quick example we had um, i was based in a in a pediatric hospital in Cambodia for for a long time and one of the uh, in Siem Reap, which is a tourist uh, destination in the city center, which wasn't ideal. So the number of tourists that we would get who, who would want to come in and, and play with a child or visit a child was numerous during the days. That was, of course, um, an issue because, I mean, you can imagine trying to get into a children's hospital in, say, London. It's like Fort Knox. You can't get in if you have no reason to be there, right? So. What, what we did actually was uh, the opposite way. We would, would have a, a separate part of the hospital that had no access to children, but had um, a, a designated person actually explain about the health issues children were facing, um, the, the problems that the country was facing, sharing about, okay, how is that in your country, etc., cetera, and, and make it a very exciting sort of um, learning exchange. And um, I remember from um, a school from Singapore, for example, where young people came, they said afterwards, the best part of our, our eight, eight day trip to Cambodia was the visit to the hospital because I, I understand now so much more. Um, and I completely understand as well why I was not allowed to interact directly with children. So I think that part, if you go with the head, not with the head of I'm going to help, I'm going to save these people from all the, these children from all the bad things in the world. But if you go with, I would like to learn because I'm truly interested. There is a lot of benefit to that. Secondly, I think volunteering, um, we often forget that you can actually volunteer where you come from as well in your own community. It's um, the thought that a volunteering needs to be done on the other side of the world is actually, um, mind-boggling because if you look around there, there say the UK where you are Isabel there are enough people in, in who would need the support of a volunteer in so many different ways why would we go to the other side of the world to do it there secondly when you volunteer volunteer in a um, with uh, what you're good at if you ask me to go to um, Zambia to build a school, that's insane. I don't even know how to hold a hammer. There is no way I can build a school. Yet a lot of people think that if you go to another country, you can suddenly help build houses or schools or whatever. So my point is always, if you volunteer, which is great, do something you're really good at. Um, and then, if at all possible, make sure that you... Um, uh, share your knowledge and expertise so it's actually becoming sustainable. So it, it means that, for example, I am a trained social worker. I um, 20 years ago, I came to Cambodia for the first time. There were no trained social workers in the country. There, there was no um, university for social work just yet. Um, and so I trained people who wanted to be social workers that made sense to me. So I didn't work directly with children because I don't speak the language. I don't have the cultural, um, you know, understanding and background, but I could support social workers there with the knowledge I had and they could, could that then make, uh, make into a culturally, uh, sen yeah, what, what would make sense in their cultural context. So um, do what you're good at, um, look close to home, um, and, and make it a learning exper uh, experience, I, I think. Um, yeah, and I think also bear in mind the travel cost, you know, the, the, the cost of going somewhere and thinking that you will help, could, that money could have spent in a much better way. It is justified. If you go to, while well, you think that you're going to help, I'm not sure if that's so justified. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tessa. 
Um, I think we're coming close to the end of our, our time now. So just, just to end, you, you already alluded to this, the tourism sector is in a really um, terrible position at the moment um, because of uh, a COVID. Um, most forms of international tourism have come to a halt. So do you think this is actually an opportunity to stop orphanage tourism and volunteering to make sure that you know we don't go back to where we were before uh, when things start to uh, move towards um, uh, people being able to travel around the world again. Mark. Uh, yes, Isabel, I think that this is a great point in time that we can reset some of the bad norms which have developed around voluntourism. Uh, I think that it, it's some key messages that we need to get out there and I think that we can collaborate and work together. I know that the travel industry are keen, as we all are, to be moving and traveling um, and to open countries like Uganda up because we are so reliant on uh, tourists because we have a beautiful country here in Uganda and we want to share it and it's great for the economy. Uh, and what we want to say is that don't make children a part of your tour experience. Children are not tourist attractions. And therefore, let us let us in, in travel and enjoy the beauty and travel for all of the reasons that Tessa just said and some really good ideas on how we can um, volunteer, uh, you know, more effectively and more conscientiously. Uh, so those are the things that we can take forward. Um, and yes, the travel industry, we, we are working with them. I know Hope and Homes are working with them, with ABTA. Uh, in order to create some messaging and have a working, there's a working group in the UK uh, to help improve uh, voluntourism and the travel industry to make sure it is more ethical, to make sure that we don't fall into these uh, bad practices of visiting orphanages. So I think it's a great moment in time. Uh, I think that the pandemic, we have to take some positives out of the pandemic and perhaps resetting some of these things uh, is, is, a, is a key thing that we can look at doing collaboratively. Thank you. Tessa, just a, a quick final word for you on that before we hand, hand back to Kate for um, any questions. I see there have been a lot. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think, um, I mean, having the opportunity here today to speak about this, um, and hopefully this will have a, a trickle effect to everyone who has been on this call today. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help. It's great that Ellen and Aubrey has given us the opportunity to, uh, to do this. I don't, I don't think I have anything else specifically um, to add. And I think there's some good questions that we should be answering. So, right. thank you. Thank you both so much. I'll just hand back to Kate now and um, uh, we'll, we'll hear some questions. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. That's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I just love, always inspired hearing you guys talk about the solutions as well as learning more about the challenges that we've got to go for. Now, I know we haven't got that much time. So, um, and some of the questions that have come through, I think you've actually answered in um, a lot of the information that you've given over to us today. There is, there is one common um, question that's come through posed in various ways but with kind of the same question within it which is a really tricky one for you guys to answer but if there is a solution to this entire issue what is the one key number one thing that we could do to prevent volunteerism where does that responsibility lie is it with governments is it with us is it the push or the pull factor we have to tackle I know that's nearly impossible to, to answer, but if there was one nugget of a solution that you think will have the biggest impact, what would that be? I can start and Mark can, uh, can add. Um, the answer is um, it's a communal uh, action that we have to take from all these different angles. So we, yes, we need to look at uh, the tourism sector. They need to take responsibility the volunteering agencies need to take responsibility. Um, we ourselves need to take responsibility. Governments, um, orphanage directors, I would say. Um, so it's it's a it's a big group, and we need to sort of attack it, so to speak, from all angles. It's not um, oh, it's all the responsibility of the government who receives the. Um, these tourists, for example, or it's it's a responsibility of the people sending. Or it's we all have a responsibility um, to be able uh, to or to ensure that children 
going forward grow up in, in loving families instead? But I think the answer is that we all have that responsibility and, and the only way we can change this is if we all take that um, and critically look at ourselves and say, okay, what can I do? Well, one, probably no longer volunteering in orphanages. Two, and that's a point that I think we have not made yet, we do not um, hope for um, donors to stop funding um, children in countries where, um, where this is happening, but we would like donors to divert their funding to um, alternatives. So that can be uh, prevention of family separation programs. That can be legislation wherever it's needed, if that needs um, a sort of push in a, in a certain direction. That can be uh, the development of kinship and foster care programs. There can be many other things. That can be investing in a, in a social workforce, a trained social workforce, for example. So we're not arguing here that people should stop caring and should stop giving. Um, but our question is, can you, can you turn that giving around um, and divert that from institutional um, care or from funding orphanages to um, other programs that ensure that children can grow up in loving families? Um, yeah, just to add on to uh, what Tessa said, if there was one thing, every country has something different and different factors why people volunteer. In terms of Asia, uh, countries like Nepal, there's a lot of backpackers, there's a lot of people that go to volunteer. In Uganda, it tends to be more religious mission trip based volunteers that are coming here. So I would say one thing for Uganda is we really need churches and religious, uh, re the religious people to really get a grasp that they're not helping and that there's been some misinterpretation of the scriptures when they fled to Uganda to help orphans. Actually, they're doing a lot of damage. So I think the one thing, if we had a silver bullet, would be for the churches to really take on board um, you know, this issue and for evangelical churches, Catholic churches to, to stop sending um, their volunteers on mission trips. Uh, because that's what we see in Uganda as being one of the biggest areas of, of volunteerism. So that would be one thing that I, I would say. Redirect the resources into something more productive, into communities, into families, and into the services that, that we need to be developed to prevent uh, separation. Thank you. I think the message that we've all got a role to play in this is really important. And I think um, Will's suggestion in terms of finding a media partner to create a film and a series around these themes to get that message out there. Well, hopefully not only will be part of this movement to change things, but we can get the rest of the world alongside as well. So that's fabulous. Um, we have, um, I'm very conscious we have run out of time, but um, as Kate um, has has indicated we will be able to um, collect any questions that haven't been answered and we can get back to you um, following up from this seminar. So I just want to you know thank you all for being here today and, and our fabulous speakers. It's been it's been brilliant. Um, we do have two more webinars coming up which I'd encourage you to come along to. So next week Isabel will be speaking to Rukia Budden who grew up in an orphanage in Kenya and is now a keen campaigner and I've heard her speak at an event and she is totally inspiring so if you have the chance to tune in please do and then the final webinar will be with um, Stefan Darabus who's the director of programs at Hope and Homes um, based out in Romania and again I've been lucky enough to spend some time with him in Romania and he is uh, equally knowledgeable and passionate about this subject um, and I think you'll all benefit from um, being able to hear his words of wisdom as well. Um, so Kate Wells you can organise um, if anyone's got any questions around timings or about getting access to a recording of this or questions and please do get in contact with her um, but just like to thank you all again for tuning in and thank our fabulous speakers and interviewers for giving up your time, lovely to see you all again um, and I look forward to see you all on the next webinar. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for all you do. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thanks, everyone.